Hello, soccer fans. Welcome on into OneSoccer.ca. Andy Petrillo, Oliver Platt, Gareth Wheeler. Welcome back home, Ollie. That is not a Costa Rican hotel room hey. behind you. That is your home. Yay. You, made it. you did. Finally. You made it. But you're you thinking also... about staying. You're thinking about considering it. It's a beautiful right. country. Never yeah. crossed my mind, to be honest. I've never been so happy to feel negative temperatures. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing beats Canada. Nothing beats home soil, my friend. But I also know, we all know, Beautiful day today. that you've been on top of everything that's been going on in the soccer world, which is why we're going to dive right into some things here. And we can't get enough of talking about Canada being part of that World Cup draw, going to Qatar. A reminder to everybody, they are in Group F, which features Belgium, Morocco, Croatia. How you feeling here, Wheels, days after the draw? Because we had... Automatic reaction, by the way, thank you to everybody who tuned into our YouTube show. We were on for four hours between the viewing party, over one million of you. Uh, thank you so much. Now that you've had a few days to digest it, Gareth, one million. Oh, there's Pepper. She wants to give her opinion. What do you make of that group? Basically the same reaction. My biggest kind of takeaway over the weekend, just talking to like friends, just people in my neighborhood, whoever I've run into about this whether it's at the restaurant or whatever, like people are just so excited and everyone is asking, even people have, that have no kind of reference points uh, about what the group actually means or how it came about. Everyone's like, Hey Gareth, what, what do you think about Canada's group? I feel like th that's the conversation. Like everyone just wants to have a little bit of confidence, understand that there could be a little bit of swagger going to this group. You, you know, just, it's like the dumb and dumber line, just like, so you're saying there's a chance like that's kind of that that's kind of it. Like people just want that positive reinforcement that, that Canada can go to the world cup and actually have a chance to come out of the group. And when asked, I, I think, yeah, they do have a chance. Like there's nowhere, they're not going to be the favorite. They're going to be the underdog in this group. I think people might be sleeping on Morocco a little bit, a team that's been at regular world cups and has some really talented players. And if they can somehow manage to get some talented players who've been a force to the outside back into the mix, then they're going to be that much better. My, my takes on Croatia remain the same. They're nowhere near the same side that was a World Cup finalist in 2018. They came through the softest group in World Cup qualifying. Yeah, players like Modric are wonderful. Perisic, great players. But I think they're in a little bit of transition here, and they could be vulnerable. And Belgium, you get them in your first game. I'd rather have Belgium in my first game than any other point. Of Hold on, we're going to get so, to that. Yeah. We're going to get so to that. that. Yeah, that's kind of my basic takeaway is like, mm -hmm. I, I'm encouraged. I'm excited. Uh, let's just see. Okay. Hey, if Brentford could beat Chelsea, anything can happen. Let's put it that way. <laughs> uh, but um, I do wonder if there's anything that I'll give you options here, Ollie, when you look at that group again, as you are able to digest who Canada will be going up against. Does anything scare you? Does anything give you hope? Ooh, scary. Uh, well, naturally, I'm going to pick the thing that scares me because that's why I do much better than uh, thinking of optimistic things. I, I, I think it's it's the same for all the teams in CONCACAF, uh, but particularly Canada, I think. Um, none of them have played any games against teams from other confederations for like two, three, four years, right? Like we, we just don't know really how we measure up against teams from other parts of the world. And, you know, if, if you're being pessimistic about it, you might make the argument that teams in Europe and South America face a higher level of internal competition in their regions. And so maybe the teams from the other areas of the world might have been left behind a bit or have lost a bit of grounds during that time um, as a result of that, because they're not playing as high a level of competition. So, you know, I, I think we all know that we needed more competitive CONCACAF games and things like the Nations League have, have been brought in to serve that. We all know that the pandemic has massively condensed the international schedule. So there's reasons why that's happened and it's been unavoidable. Um, but it does mean that, you know, Canada, US, Mexico, all of these teams haven't had the, the opportunity to, to go to Europe and play European sides and measure themselves against that kind of competition. So, you know, any and as many games as they can fit in uh, against European teams, maybe against the South American team or whoever it is prior to the tournament, maybe an African team now they're playing against Morocco. As much as they can fit into that schedule of, of pre-tournament games, they, they have to really push that and do that as much as they can. That's going to be vital, I think, because we, we just haven't seen Canada play against these types of teams in terms of the style of play being different, but also in terms of the quality that they have and testing themselves against those opponents. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and Herdman, when he came onto our show afterwards, the YouTube show did say that he also wanted to get onto some European soil there and play against these yeah. teams and have that type of experience. That's for sure. But let's go back to something you touched on Gareth because Canada gets things started against Belgium. Now ranked the number two. Oh, horrible. Number two. Uh, but they had been number one for <sighs> so long. Two. <laughs> they, they had been number one for so long. Brazil has leapt over them. But you look at their last two World mm. Cups, right? So 2018, third place team. Uh, 2014, quarterfinals. I mean, this is a, a perennial contender. This is a strong team. And of course, we're just kind of playing the games here of would you rather. But, you know, do you think it's a good thing to get the toughest team in this group out of the way first? Play them first. Or would you rather ease into it and maybe play a team that you wouldn't consider to be the strongest, which would probably be Morocco. No, no. Case. You never want your, your first game to be your most high pressure. Like if they're playing Morocco in the first game and they're expected to come out with a flyer and win. I don't know. I'd, I'd, I'd like to see them play Belgium first. This is kind of like the free hit, right? Like this yeah. is like, see what you mm -hmm. can do. Um, so no, and all the pressures on Belgium, like, let's be honest here. Like how many times in recent tournaments have we said, Oh, Belgium, like, it, it, it's kind of like the, the the team that just, whether it's a hardcore or casual fan watching the tournament, look out for Belgium this tournament. They haven't won a thing. They've been a significant disappointment. They got knocked out by Japan in the last World Cup. Let's be honest here. They got knocked out by Italy ugh, at the Euros. Like, I just, <laughs> I can't, I, Andy. I, I, had to, I had to throw that in. I'm not serious. Because we're like, not in studio, getting brave, getting yes, brave. Yes. All, the, all, the, all, the, all the pressure's on Belgium here. So there, there's no way around it. And there's a lot to be decided about between now and when the tournament starts. Like, Lukaku scored like 68 and 101 for country. It's been absolutely phenomenal. He's not playing right now for Chelsea. What what club is he going to end at? What's Eden Hazard? What's his form going to be like that? Like heading into the tournament, is he going to stay off the pies long enough to like get himself in shape? Like I don't know. Like let's just see because th these Belgian players are wonderful. They play at big clubs, uh, big competitions. Uh, I, I like the the ties between Jonathan David and him having played in Belgium. Same thing goes for Tejan Buchanan now. So. Let's just see. Belgium should be one of the favorites, not only to win this game, but to go to win the tournament. But they're feeling all the pressure here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you want to play them first. Um, like maybe Belgium do what some big teams do every, you know, there's always one every tournament, right? A big team just goes belly up and, and it's the end of a cycle or whatever. And, Germany. you know, they, they don't, they, exactly, they don't get through the group. Um, I don't think that will happen. I think Canada will probably lose to Belgium. You know, Belgium may not have won a tournament yet, but they, they dominate the group stage, right? Like they've won 11 out of 12 games in the last four tournaments in the group stage. So Canada is probably going to lose this game. Like Gareth said, it's a free hit. You have a go. You try and get something out of it. If you can, that's absolutely brilliant and, and could be huge in the group. Um, but you want this game first because it's the one that's that's going to be the most difficult to win. And, and then, you know, you've got your legs underneath you, you're in the tournament and you go into those two, you know, for me, the two big games that will decide whether whether Canada can get to the knockout stage or not with that experience of, of having played the first game under your belt. We feel we've answered this question when it comes to Alfonso Davies and where he plays in John Herdman's lineup when they're going up against CONCACAF side. So that's why I'm bringing this question back up again, because now... It's the World Cup. So does Herdman change where he plays Alfonso Davies? So that's why I ask in the first match against Belgium, so a completely different opponent here, Ollie. are you playing Davies if you're Herdman as a striker, a wingback, or are you putting him in that left-back role? He's not playing left-back, um, but there's no chance, especially against a team like Belgium. Like, if he was playing left back, he might not get out of his own half, right? Like, the, the, there's no chance that he's going to play in that position. I, I think there's flexibility further forward as to how exactly he plays. You know, we saw when they went to Mexico, he played on the wing and was was very effective there. Mm -hmm. We've seen other times that he's played up front with a striker and in a front two, and, and he's, you know, he's been very dangerous in that role as well. So I, I think it's, you know, probably the most likely is that he'll play both, right? You know, the way this Canada team plays, they switch formations in-game. You'll see him play through the middle at times um, as, as more of a striker and you'll see him play as a winger as well. And, and they have the option of going to a front two like Davies and Laren or Davies and Davids. But then also the front three when you add Buchanan in the mix or, or play both of the strikers um, can be very dangerous as well. So I think all of those are options, but they all involve Alfonso Davies playing further forward as a striker or at the very least as a very advanced winger against a team like Belgium. You want him high up the pitch and, and a constant threat on the counter-attack.
I, I know exactly how I want to play this game already. I was thinking about it over the over the weekend. I want Davies in a free roll to play in behind Laren and David, but the ability to go up and make it a three. So a three, four, three. He plays centrally, but he has the freedom to roam ahead of Eustachio and Atiba and just uh, allow that tactical versatility. He needs to play. He's going to have to play between the lines, not only drawing Axel Witzel back into position, but the back three for Belgium, like this is the best part about playing Belgium is you know exactly how they're going to play, to be honest with you. It's not the fastest back three. I think he can attack from a deeper line position, cause some problems through channels for this Belgium side. He has to play an attack. I'll, like, look, I'll, I'll take Tejan Buchanan in a little bit more of a reserve role to get Alfonso Davies pushed higher up the field. I think there's no question, but I don't even play him as a winger, Ollie. I just want him in the middle of the park. I want to have the freedom to kind of pull the strings, yeah. and I want them to be more concerned about Alfonso Davies than what Canada is concerned about how Belgium's attacking out of the back. I don't know if there's any free roles against Belgium. That he's, he's going to have some, every player in the team is going to have some defensive response from, an, from an free role from an attacking position. Yeah. Okay. Like okay. where he I, attacks, I think, obviously from a defensive position. It's yeah. It's, I think almost the more interesting question is something we was just kind of touched upon there is, can you play David and Laren in that game? Uh, both at the same time. I'm, I'm not sure if, if they'll both play. I, I think you might have to choose one or the other, but you know, it's a long way off. We'll see. Well, we've seen the last few games. <laughs> Herdman has loved putting David and Laren together. He's loved yeah. that dynamic. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if he changes that up, we'll see. Are you, are you judging me, Andy, that I'm thinking about this stuff already? I actually, <laughs> I, I was switched. driving and I was kind of daydreaming thinking about this stuff on the weekend. I've seen your little papers and how you draw your little X's and you do your little, I've seen the mastermind at work. Tactics notebook. Yeah, the method to the madness. He comes Mine up with all the tactics. goes in the trash after, though. So. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas Herdman goes up on the big board. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at the two other opponents. So Croatia, Morocco, as we know. Croatia lost in the finals uh, in 2018 at the last World Cup to France. And then Morocco, they didn't qualify for the World Cup from 2002 to 2014. They did qualify in 2018. They didn't make it out of the group stage. Which do you think, Wheels, would be the more winnable game between those two? Probably Morocco, based upon reputation. Like, they were competitive at last World Cup in a group with, with Spain, and uh and, and portugal so they, they they played in groups with tough teams but mm -hmm. we'll see what happens with ziach um you know hakimi is a top top right back but the the pedi there's there's still pedigree in this croatia side anytime that you see luka, luka modric line up you, you know that you could be in for for a special performance he is 36 now we're what going to be another six months on from this uh kovacic rozovic like it's a combative midfield but I think that you can kind of maybe run at them, maybe kind of expose them a little bit more. They have some young players they're bringing into the back line, so things are kind of turning over a little bit. But I, I don't know, Ollie. What do you think? I, I really don't have a definitive answer because I'm not really sure what either side is going to look like in November. I think I have a better idea what Belgium's going to be, right? I think if they're still missing Ziyech, it's, it's Morocco. Um, they've got the same problem as, as the CONCACAF teams, that they've barely played anyone, like, really, of World Cup standard for, for two or three years. Like, they played Egypt and uh, the Cup of Nations. But other than that, they like Ghana, but Ghana haven't been very good lately. So their schedule has been against a lot of the kind of lesser African teams that, that don't really prepare you for a World Cup, I don't think. It's, it's, I think it's going to sound a lot like we're kind of writing Morocco off over the next few months, and I don't I'm need not. to do that because because they're a decent side and, and we shouldn't. But it's almost just like a, the reality is, is that if Canada is going to get through the group, they, they probably have to beat Morocco. So we kind of have to take it as a given that this game has to be a win for Canada or else talking about Croatia and Belgium is kind of irrelevant, right? So I don't mean to be disrespectful in that way because I don't think it's going to be an easy game. It's just one that Canada has to be looking at and thinking, we, we have to win this to have a chance of getting out of the group. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we're going to continue to dissect this till the cows come home because the Canadians are going to Qatar 2022. But let's turn our attention now to Major League Soccer. And it was a hat trick, gentlemen, for the Canadian teams, all picking up wins over the weekend for CF Montreal, Vancouver. It was also their first win of the season. Uh, let's look at CF Montreal because that was a big win for them. 4-3 was the final against Cincinnati. Um, and you had uh, Mahelovic, Grayson. How about Kai Kamara, 37 years of age? He that he picks up a goal, his first 
in Major League Soccer since October 2020. He spent the 2021 season playing in Finland. But what were you more impressed by, Wheels? Would it be the 37-year-old Kai Kamara's performance or, or, so that's what you could be impressed by, or were you concerned, again, with Montreal's defense? Well, game of either or. Yeah, yeah, a little either yeah. or. I snuck in well, there without you even really. Well, Ollie realized it. <laughs> that was a must win. That was a must win for Montreal. The way they started the season, uh, mm -hmm. FC Cincinnati is not a very good team, and they rode their luck at times against FC Cincinnati, didn't they? Defensively, I'm surprised that they struggled so much. But look, I, I kind of had bigger questions about this team, what they would look like in attack, where the goals would come from outside of Kyoto with some of the injuries in this team. So the fact that Mihailovic is playing on the level that he's playing right now, that bodes well. The fact that they fought through it after conceding twice within the first 20 minutes, that's a positive thing. They just needed that first win. And if they had lost to FC Cincinnati, then I think you start asking questions. You're like, okay, we we didn't go as far as you wanted in the Champions League, kind of wasted that opportunity. We're struggling to start this season. Like, how does this improve? Because I actually think they're, they're a good team. I think they have all the ingredients to be a very competitive team in this league. So what impressed me the most is just the fact that they got over the line and found a way to win this game. And what turned out to be one of the better games in Major League Soccer over the course of the weekend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a ton to like about this team, but there's a big problem, which is they can't defend at all right now. Like, it's it's embarrassingly bad, some of the goals they're conceding. The first two goals were shocking, and, and the penalty they conceded for the third one wasn't much better. So, like, you, you look through this team, like, Mihailovic is playing, like, a legit MVP contender right now. He's He's been unbelievable. When Yama, I think, in possession has been very good, maybe out of possession, there's a few more question marks. Kone's been an absolute revelation. You've got Kyoto. Kamara looks like he can play a role. Um, you know, even even at the age he's at now, still looks like a decent player in this league. So there's a lot to like going forwards and what they do when they have the ball. But defensively, it's a mess. It's it's an absolute shambles. And 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 that side of it is, you know, at risk of kind of wasting all the potential they've got um at the other end of the pitch. So there's there's a few reasons for that, I think. Like Alistair Johnston didn't have a great preseason because of COVID, so he hasn't really settled in yet, and he's obviously gonna be a a big player for them. Um, I think Brezza at this point, James Pansemis needs to, to get a go because I just don't think he's really commanding his box and commanding that back line as, as well as you'd like. We know he can make the big save, but is he kind of authoritative enough? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see Pansemis get a try. But, but yeah, they've got to find some solutions at the back because there is a, a lot of real potential in this team if they can stop leaking goals the way they are. And should you be playing with a back five or a back four? They brought in Corbo from Bologna. He hasn't really had a, had a sniff. Like, what's going to be the best formation for this team going forward? Um, you know, who's your – you know, when Schwanier is not playing, I think that if you're trying to play three at the back with the two fullbacks, you're, you're missing a little bit of something, right? I think Alistair Johnson's a much better player playing in a back four or the right side of a three rather than getting pushed forward up and playing more of a fullback position. Yeah. So will Fred Nancy, I think he needs to kind of figure this out a little bit more. Not only, I think it's a fair point about Johnston, um, Ollie, but also Rudy Camacho signed his contract late. Yeah. He kind of, yeah. He, he joined a moving train as well. Mm -hmm. Well, on the flip side, Vancouver um, seems to be playing defensively well, but they just can't score goals. In fact, they have three on the season right now. That is tied for Lois in MLS. And it was the youngster, 23-year-old Ryan Raposo, who picks up his first MLS goal over the weekend as Vancouver picked up their first win as well. That was over Kansas City. Um, and I just wonder, I mean, what's the answer for the Whitecaps here, Ollie, in getting more goals? I still just don't really think they're playing to the strengths of their best players in an attacking sense. And, you know, defensively, they, they've been good. And sometimes when you have a bad start to the season, that's the answer, right? You just try and grind a couple of results out and a couple of clean sheets and get yourself going. And I've got no problem with that. And they did a good job of that against Kansas City on the weekends. I, I just think looking longer term, like I, I don't understand when Dahomey has been one of your most consistent attacking contributors. Caicedo, they've invested quite a lot of money in. And now they've decided not to play with wingers. Like it, it just doesn't really make any sense to me from a recruitment point of view and from a point of view of getting the best out of this team. And not just those two, but, you know, giving Ryan Gould some options to pass to, some pace, you know, around him. Giving Lucas Cavallini some wide players that can get service in to, to the box that he kind of thrives on. Brian White, same thing. Um, you know, I, I just don't really get the system change they've made and the way that it's left 
those two players who are me are, for me are, are key in, in an attacking sense, kind of on the outside or playing in positions that they aren't best suited to. Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. Uh, my kind of focus on the weekend was more about Ryan Raposo. I'm thrilled for him. You know, when you're a young Canadian player and you're in the top few picks in an MLS super draft, I mean, that comes with expectations. And let's be honest, he's like kind of, you know, failed to impress in his early MLS career. I'm hoping that this gets him going because there's a player there. There absolutely is a player there. But again, to Ollie's point, what position are you going to get the most out of him? Sometimes it's like mm -hmm. square pegs, round holes. And I think that you just need to kind of define that role. But hopefully this gets... Him kick started. Hopefully, this kick starts the Vancouver Whitecaps season again. I'm 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 with Ollie here. Just some of the players and the roles that they're playing and the overall makeup of the squad. It, it, I, I'm not sure if Sartini's found the proper identity or the proper way to take this team forward from last year. Like the kind of the team kind of picked itself coming down the stretch, and they played a a, a way that kind of was consistent week in week out. I, I still think he's trying to search for something here. Toronto FC rounds out the uh, three Canadian clubs and picking up a victory. So a 2-1 win for them over the defending champs, New York City FC. Second straight win for Toronto. Um, so they're way, way too early sitting in a playoff position. But we know that they're also with a new coach. We know that they're also trying to figure out their lineup. Um, they've also been hit with injuries as well. So when you look at this squad wheels, do you still have some areas you know, of, of concern? What would be your areas of concern? Or are you looking at it going, I really feel like they've turned a corner under the new head coach, Bob Bradley? Well, they have turned a corner under Bob Bradley. Like the movement, both on and off the ball, has been beyond anything that I expected five games into Bob Bradley's tenure. I mean, the way that something little, the way that he's using Pozuelo, and it was something that even Greg Vanny had a difficult time figuring out, like the best place to play him. But now he's playing him underneath Jimenez alongside of Petrasso on, on the weekend where he doesn't have to be on the flank. He's central. He's allowed to kind of pull the springs from an underneath position. Just this system works for Toronto FC. And Bob Bradley's sure. gone away from his 4-3-3 came in with, but three center backs, two wide players, you know, a, a role that kind of suits Michael Bradley playing a little, a, a little bit more playing alongside in Azorio, a little bit more of a deeper role with those two players right in front. Like, the formation of this team and the way that they're playing, it's excellent. Honestly, like it's got some real potential. Add Insigne, Andy, you asked, what do they need? Well, you know, Kosi Thompson played wonderful on the mm -hmm. weekend. I thought he was great. You know, what Petrasso's done, what Schaffelberg's done. I still think that you need more, a, a more accomplished fullback and another defender to play in the back three. That's what I'm looking at right now, those two <laughs> positions of need potentially another goal scorer. Jimenez is being great, three goals in five, but you can see what he's trying to do. Akinola will come back into the team. Jaquil Marshall Ruddy, it's a little bit of a blow, the fact that he's out a while. You know, Ralph Prizo's being eased back into things. So I, what you want to see for a team that was so bad last year and is completely remaking themselves, to see the players buy in and you, you kind of get the sense of direction that they're going. I'm seeing that. And the fact that they've won back-to-back -back games is an absolute bonus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think it's, you know, it should be surprising because Bob Bradley is, is a very good coach and, and he's proven in this league, but he's pushing all the right buttons with, with the players he's got at his disposal. You know, he's getting the best out of Pozuelo or starting to get the best out of Pozuelo, which was always going to be key in this early part of the season. If TFC were, were going to put points on the board, he's the difference maker they have. Um, the back three has given the midfield a bit more cover, which I think was was clearly needed after the first couple of games. So he's just doing things that that make sense for the squad he's currently got, and that's what he's done, you know, through his whole career. And he, he's a very good coach in that way. I, I think the question is still, and I've said this a few times now, so I'm repeating myself a little bit, but the question is still just how do you evolve it to a team that could look very different after the midway point in the season when Insigne arrives and probably more players arrive and Akinola is back. Um, and, and things could change a little bit. You know, can you play Insigne and Pozuelo both underneath the striker? Or is that too many guys who want the ball all the time? You know, kind of like in, in basketball, having two very ball heavy players, right? And not enough kind of moving around them. Um, there, there's questions like that that he's going to have to to kind of figure out an answer as more players, you know, arrive, and particularly Insigne and, and the team evolves in that way. I, uh, I that's think still the can... question. I think he can play there, Ollie. Him and Pozuelo because, as creators because. playing under underneath Jimenez, where you have that structure behind that. That's why I think that 
probably another central defender like O'Neill McNaughton have been very good, but there's not a whole lot of depth there. Like Salcedo's a beast. Like what what a player yeah. he is. He, yeah. And then and then you know relying on like 19, 20 year old players straight out of the academy to provide the consistency over the season. That's probably a little bit of a concern. So addressing and maybe bringing another fullback. But after that, I'm like, yeah, that that's a team playing in this shape. A lot has to go their way, right? Like can't have injuries, can't have suspensions. You start taking away these players, then you might be a little bit thin, but man, there's a lot to like here in the early stages. I thought CPL graduate Lucas McNaughton picked up his first goal over the weekend. It ended up being an own goal. For New York, but he was so close he to get there. He's looked to, really good, goal. Andy. I like we heard yes, reports yes. over the course of preseason mm -hmm. that he was a fit. Like he's looked really good. I think the fact that he's a little bit older helps him as well. Yeah. Like, right? Like physically, he doesn't he's look ready out of place. Play. No, yeah. he does not. All right. A Canadian um Olympian, an Olympic champion, and a Canadian national is taking their talents back to North America. And that would be Janine Becky, who joined Manchester City back in the summer of 2018. She has now signed a new three-year deal with Portland Thorns. So she's joining Christine St. Clair, Rian Wilkinson, another Canadian who's the coach. And as we know, Karina LeBlanc is the GM. So Canadians, I guess, are really taking their talents there to Portland. But let's look back just a little bit here on her career, Ollie, with Manchester City and just how that helped in Janine Becky's development. Yeah, I think it it did help. I think it you know two things can be true, right? The the Man City move was was great for her and has allowed her to develop her career and develop as a player. And also, it was the right time to move on and, and look for something different. And I think we've all kind of seen that coming over the past few weeks, just because she's not you know a regular in that starting eleven. And when you look at the role she has for Canada, who are you know one of the top national teams in the world, the Olympic gold medalists, obviously. Um, she's a very she, she's a key player for that team, a star of that team, and so that you know for that to follow on a club level, I think was the natural thing and the thing she needed to do at this point in her career in her in her prime years. So I, I think we've seen a lot of players who have gone to Europe, gone to these top clubs, play around other top players, train with them, um, you know, have a great environment in terms of the infrastructure and the coaching and so on. It has undoubtedly helped them. But now's the time for Janine Becky to find a place where she is going to be one of the star players. And, and I think she can do that in Portland. She can start every week and, and really be a key piece of that team. And, and that will only help her with Canada as well. One, one of the interesting things about Portland is that they uh, they usually play a back five and no wingers. They play with wing backs. So, you know, we've seen Becky play a little bit in that kind of role for Canada. And maybe that's where, where Portland see her fitting in as well. Was is you you two might probably have more insight than me. Like, was this a move based on personal reasons, professional reasons? Like a, a player that's in her prime, you know, City's it's sounding a good team, purely right? professional from what we're hearing. This is a purely yeah. professional move. I mean, obviously she'll be missed with Man City, and it's worth noting. I mean, she picked up two FA Cups while there, two Continental Cups. Yeah. So she she had a winning pedigree with Manchester City. Um, I'm I'm believing this is also the Karina LeBlanc effect. But I think that this is, I mean, we know that the NWSL is growing. We're starting to see, right, with the new, their first ever CBA. I shouldn't say new CBA, but they get a CBA. We're seeing base salaries moving on up as well. We're seeing where, you know, these women can actually earn a proper living too. Why wouldn't you also want to be closer to home in that sense? But this is also sounding pretty professional. Trinity Rodman, as we know, is one of the, you know, became the highest paid player. I wonder though, Gareth, just, you know, what we've also seen from Janine, even what she is able to do with the national team, if she could become one of those upper echelon players in the NWSL, she's older, she's 27, Olympic champion, right, has some cups under her belt with Man City. I just wonder if she can now, as she returns, because she started her career in the NWSL, could return and be a superstar here. Yeah, well, look, she's going to a great club <laughs> with some wonderful people involved as well. There's the, there's a the Canadian flavor there. Like, look, like it's not it's not a bad place to go. But this is the eternal debate that we always continue to have: is is it better for you know young men and women to go apply their trade overseas in in, in different leagues or play domestically? I think we've had that conversation on the show multiple times. Yeah. NWSL or, or go over and play in the Super League, and as these leagues continue to grow in popularity and promise in places like England, in places like Spain, as the French League, the, like there's, there's some good football being played. And I think the popularity overseas 
is at a level that we haven't experienced before. So I, I, that's why I was just curious, the motivation behind the move. I don't really have a feel whether this is a good step of, of you know, maybe a step back lateral move in, in her career, what that could mean for the Canadian women's national team. I think we quite frankly need to see that the way that the way that it plays out, but it was notable to me, the fact mm -hmm. that she is coming back. It seemed like, you know, I know she was battling for some minutes and some time, but there was had to be plenty of clubs where she could have been a fit if she wanted to stay in Europe. So that's what that's what it just struck me as as a, a notable move. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I, she, she's not young anymore. That's the thing, right? Like we're we're not talking about a Heisman or a Fleming here. We're talking about someone in their prime who should be playing yeah. somewhere every week. You know, Janine Becky is clearly good enough to do that, and it just didn't seem like that that opportunity was going to come with Manchester City. I think maybe she could argue she deserved a bit more of an opportunity to earn that kind of role at City, yeah. but it, it didn't happen. So I, I think, you know, I, I think this was pretty inevitable that she would, whether it's Europe or NWSL, she was going to look for a place where she could be that star player. And I, I, think I wanted to see her with United. I wanted to see her with United. <laughs> you want strong. everyone to go to United. I know. If you're a good player, I want you to. You don't really have any good players. Well, until that Canadian <laughs> well, the team side, yes. comes, then it seems the Canadians have all made their way to Portland. So uh, best of luck there to Janine, Becky. Great show, gentlemen. As always, a ton of stuff that we talked about here. We always appreciate you tuning into onesoccer.ca to get your soccer dose. That's Gareth. That's Ollie. I'm Andy. We'll see you next time.